Okie dokie. Uh, I'm John Surick. I'm Director of Media Relations at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and I appreciate your, the attendance of all of you today. Um, all reporters and attendees will be on mute until it's time for questions. Uh, this event is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be av available on our website approximately two hours after the end of the call. <clears throat> the agenda for today is uh, we're going to start with Beth McGee, uh, who's going to talk about why we do the report and what we're looking at. Allison Prost will then give a big picture overview. Uh, Harry Campbell, our Pennsylvania uh, person, will be talking about the Pennsylvania th end of things. Josh, our Maryland executive director, will also be uh, talking about the Maryland situation. Peggy will talk about uh, Virginia and Denise Stranko will, who is our federal affairs director, will give a federal overview. Uh, John Mueller <clears throat> will also be available for questions. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of housekeeping items. If you'd like to ask a question, uh, let us know in the Q&A function. We need to know your name, affiliation, and <clears throat> you do not need to type in the entire question. Uh, we're reserving the chat function for technical difficulties. If you're having a technical difficulty, please uh, let us know in the chat function. So to kick it off, let's go to Beth McGee, our Director of Science and Agricultural Policy. Uh, to fill us in on why we're doing this and how we did it. Great, thanks, John. Uh, again, Beth McGee, B-E-T-H-M-C-G-E-E, -E, Director of Science and Agricultural Policy. I'm happy to be with you all this morning. Thanks for attending. We only have four years to go uh, before the 2025 implementation deadline. So it's really important that we uh, get a sense of what's on track, what's working, and, and probably more importantly, what's not working. This report looks at three states, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, which collectively account for 90% of the pollution going into the Chesapeake Bay. So they're sort of the, the big three. And we looked at a couple of things. Um, first, we used the Chesapeake Bay program scientific model to estimate the pollution reduction benefits of progress to date. So um, wastewater treatment upgrades, cover crops, forested buffers, all the things the states are reporting to the Environmental Protection Agency um, crunch through the model to look at um, if they implemented all those things, where they would do in terms of pollution reductions. And we compared those, that progress as of 2020 to where they need to be in 2025 and assess whether using those modeled estimates of pollution loads, whether they're on track or off track to achieve their 2025 uh, pollution reduction commitments. The second thing we looked at um, well, let me step back. So we looked at um, not only the total uh, benefits of all those cumulative actions, but sector by sector. So we looked at agriculture, urban and suburban stormwater. And the, the benefit of doing that is that, and what you will see if you look at the report is that we have um, some states that are looked to be overall on track, but largely that's due to improvements in wastewater. And so by looking at individual sectors, we get a sense of how are we doing in these individual areas of pollution reduction. Uh, the second thing we look at is the programs and practices that are really important to achieve those pollution reduction goals all, all, um, over time. So we, we have plans um, and we really need to make sure those plans are implemented and the practices and programs that are really important to achieve those pollution reductions. So we are looking at the state commitments to those um, that occurred um, through their milestone commitment process, as well as looking longer term um, where they expect to be in 2025. Great, thanks, Beth. Um, next, we'll go to Allison Prost, our Vice President for Environmental Protection and, excuse me. Allison, okay. go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Um, as John mentioned, I'm Allison Prost, A-L-I-S-O-N-P-R-O-S-T. I'm the Vice President for Environmental Protection and Restoration at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Um, I echo Beth and John's thanks for joining us this morning. Um, I can't stress enough, we have four years to go to 2025, less than um, now, and we're at a critical juncture. Also important to stress, 
the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint is working. Over the long term, we're seeing pollution runoff in many areas decreasing. The trend in summer dead zones is getting better, but we have a steep road ahead of us to finish the job. In addition to the unique challenges that each state is facing, uh, we have uh, continuing loss of forest and farmland to development is a very serious threat. And of course, climate change threatens our progress with the blueprint as well. Related to land use changes between 2014 and 2018, the Chesapeake Bay watershed lost 270,000 acres of forest. Uh, to put that in perspective, that's an area nearly three times the size of Washington, D.C., Richmond, Annapolis, and Harrisburg combined. The watershed's adding nearly 25,000 acres of urban development every year. These are troubling signs for our future because it means we have even more reductions to make. Overall, though, Maryland and Virginia have plans that are on track to meet their pollution commitments. However, that progress is due largely to wastewater treatment plant upgrades. Very important, but this is not enough to finish the job and it's not enough to sustain the reductions long term. To finish the job, both states are going to need a major acceleration in agricultural pollution and also come up with strategies to tackle the increasing pollution from urban and suburban development and the forest loss that I mentioned already. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania remains far off track, and this threatens the entire blueprint success, and equally as important, the ability to restore local waterways. Because if the Pennsylvania waterways are not clean, the downstream bay will not be clean. But if action is taken on the ground in Pennsylvania, we'll see improvements in both. As said before, four years to meet the 2025 implementation deadline of the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint. And our assessment of the collective progress by the three primary Bay States found that without an acceleration, the blueprint sadly will be another failed effort to restore this national treasure. For more than 35 years, the science has been clear about what must be done to restore the Bay. There have been multiple restoration agreements during that time, promises made, but failure to deliver. The plans on paper that we have are a good start, but what really matters is that on the ground implementation. That is what is essential. To have that implementation, we need strong leadership from the states. We need state plans that have reasonable assurance that the work is going to get done and be a success. And we need our federal partner, EPA, holding the jurisdictions accountable. It's those three things state leadership, EPA accountability to the states and plans that have reasonable assurance behind them. That was what's gonna get us to 2025. More than a year ago, Chesapeake Bay Foundation and our partners, Anne Arundel County, Maryland, uh, the Watermen's Association of Maryland, Robert Whitescarver and Jeannie Hoffman, who operate a livestock farm in Virginia, filed suit against EPA for its failure to date to hold Pennsylvania accountable for its shortfall. We've seen the attorney generals from Delaware, Maryland and the District of Columbia and Virginia all file suit against EPA as well. We need to collectively hold the Commonwealth accountable. Without that, our Bay restoration efforts and clean water in Pennsylvania are sure to fail. Pennsylvania yesterday submitted a new plan to EPA. We are still reviewing that. But the fact remains that the Commonwealth is far behind where it needs to be. It has an enormous amount of work to do to catch up. And we need the commitments out of the governor and the General Assembly that they're going to provide sufficient funding. Without that funding, there is no reasonable assurance, regardless of what is written in the plan, that we will see the level of practices that we need to on the ground. We know what needs to be done. Success is within our grasp. We're at a point that this could be the environmental success story. We can save this national treasure. It can be an example of clean water across the country. But for that to happen, the trajectory has to change. We need increased leadership from EPA. We need the states to double down on their efforts and accelerate things. And we need uh, Pennsylvania to put funding and reasonable assurance behind their plan. 
But again, it is possible. We can be the success story of clean water, uh, but changes need to happen. And I think our report highlights what needs to happen in each of the states to change this trajectory. Thank you. So from Virginia, we're gonna hear from Peggy Sanner. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, the Virginia Executive Director, and my name is Peggy, P-E-G-G-Y, Sanner, S-A-N-N-E-R. Virginia, of course, has been engaged in a long and bipartisan effort to restore the Bay since 1980, uh, working with its uh, uh, regional partners, and has been a leader throughout that time. In recent years in particular, Governor Northam and legislators have built a strong, detailed, and very practical plan, implementing really effective programs that should enable Virginia to have all necessary measures in place by the 2025 deadline. Yet despite the Commonwealth's historic and bipartisan commitment and its strong leadership, a persistent lack of investment in important programs has been a drag on restoration efforts. Agriculture is Virginia's number one industry. The state is rightly proud of it. Um, it has, uh, covers the largest land area in Virginia and it is therefore the largest contributor of uh, pollution to our local rivers and the Bay. Our farmers are committed to adopting the effective conservation practices needed to protect water quality, yet Virginia has never supported our farmers adopting effective practices at the levels needed and indeed at the levels that are commensurate with farmers' interests. Lack of adequate investment in water-related infrastructure continues to plague our localities who are struggling with outdated storm sewer systems, struggling to control polluted runoff. Indeed, we still have uh, cities that have systems that allow raw sewage to flow into some of our most important waterways, for example, the Potomac and the James. The funding to address polluted runoff and to stem the flow of sewage to our rivers has never been adequate in the Commonwealth. This, however, is the year when these problems can be addressed. This year, there is sufficient money in the state's important water quality improvement fund to fully support the needs of farmers. Revenues are also available to assist localities to reduce stormwater and sewage pollution to our streams in the Bay without starving other necessary state programs. It's truly an exciting and unprecedented opportunity. We therefore urgently call on Governor-elect Youngkin, his incoming administration, and all of our legislators not to let this precious, historic, and necessary opportunity slip away. Now is the time to give farmers what they need and have long been asking for. Now is the time to assist localities as they struggle to curb pollution while fostering necessary economic development. Now is the time to ensure that Virginia fully lives up to its Bay commitments. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Next, we'll hear from Josh Kurtz from Maryland. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for, for being here, John. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Josh Kurtz, J-O-S-H-K-U-R-T-Z, and I'm the Maryland Executive Director. Today, I want to talk to you about a couple areas where we have seen success and, and how we need to sustain that and really ramp up the pace and an area of real significant concern here in Maryland. When you look at the progress we've made, it has come primarily through our wastewater treatment plant upgrades and the success of the Cupper Crop Program in Maryland. And the thing that connects those two things is dedicated funding streams, which have been critical to the success. We know, we have assurance that the money will be there and so we can get practices in the ground. When we look at the success of the wastewater treatment plant upgrades, the real key we have now is sustaining that success, sustaining those levels of pollution reduction. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that these plants are being inspected and that enforcement action is taken when they don't meet their, their permitted requirements. Earlier this year, we saw issues in Baltimore City and St. Mary's that were troubling and can really set us back in the wastewater space. In agriculture, we've seen success in the cover crop program, which has contributed to the steady decline of nutrient pollution, but we haven't quite met the pace or reached the pace that we need in order to meet the goal in that, in, in that sector. We know how to get there though. We need to increase the natural filters across the agricultural landscape, things like forested buffers, really the things that 
to help us kind of axe the sponge and pull pollution out, out of the out of the water and keep it on the landscape. The largest area of concern here in Maryland, though, is stormwater. When you look at the graphs and you look at the trajectories, this is really the one that is going in the wrong direction. As Allison said, we have a large amount of development that is far outpacing our ability to retrofit existing hard surfaces, parking lots, roads, buildings. And so the amount of stormwater pollution is increasing. When you layer on top of that climate change, more water, faster paced, flashier storms, it's only becoming harder and becoming more dangerous, not only for our waterways, but also for our citizens. And the primary means in which we tackle that in Maryland is through our municipal separate storm sewer permit systems, or permits, sorry, the, all those S's really tripped me up, the MS4s. When we look at the permits which were released this year, they do not go far enough for incorporating climate change impacts and requiring the practices we need to decrease stormwater pollution, to hold water, to protect our waterways and our people. In order to, to make headway and, and reach our 2025 goals in the stormwater space, we're going to really need to ramp up acceleration and implementation of our natural filters, rain gardens, tree plantings. And we have an opportunity to do that. We are in a strong budget position in the state of Maryland. We have federal funds that we need to flow to the municipalities and localities to be able to, be able to achieve these goals. And I just want to echo what Allison said. We have the science, we know what we need to do. Now it's about going out there and implementing it in, in the timeframe that we have to meet our goals. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, from Pennsylvania, we're gonna hear from Harry Campbell. Good morning, everyone. My name is Harry Campbell, H-A-R-R-Y-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. I'm the Science Policy and Advocacy Director in the Pennsylvania Office of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. As our State of the Blueprint report makes clear, Pennsylvania, despite leading the Bay watershed in pollution reductions in 2020, remains significantly behind in implementing its Clean Water Blueprint commitments. Just yesterday, Pennsylvania publicly released an amended plan called the Phase Three Watershed Implementation Plan, which, according to the state, would achieve 100% of Pennsylvania's pollution reduction commitments by 2025, if fully implemented. We are reviewing that plan. But before it was amended, Pennsylvania's plan would have only achieved 75% of its 32 million pound nitrogen reduction goal, of which more than 90% is to come from our agricultural community, those 33,000 plus farms that are part of Pennsylvania's Chesapeake Bay watershed. That plan also identified an annual funding shortfall of over $324 million annually. Fortunately, there are many boots on the ground working hard to restore Pennsylvania's rivers and streams. State and local agency leaders Farmers, sportsmen, and women, conservation districts, and local communities want to do more to protect and restore Pennsylvania's water bodies. But by consistently underfunding clean water efforts, Pennsylvania's legislators have failed to uphold their promises to them. There are glimmers of hope, however. Right now, Pennsylvania's General Assembly is considering legislation that would establish a Clean Streams Fund. This fund would invest $250 million of the state's unallocated Federal Amer American Rescue Plan funding towards reducing pollution from the top three sources of stream pollution in the state. Half of that would go towards establishing a new statewide Farm Conservation Cost Share Program to be administered by county conservation districts. It's called the Agricultural Conservation Assistance Program. Other federal funding, like the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure law, should also be used to invest further in the state's blueprint. But at a minimum, the Clean Streams Fund is critically important for Pennsylvania getting back on track. 
Continued failure means failure for the entire partnership. It means the health and well-being as quality of life of all Pennsylvanians will be degraded. Pennsylvania's legislature must act quickly and substantially to invest in these efforts. If not, EPA must hold the state accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Next, we're going to hear from Denise Stranko, our federal uh, affairs director. The federal government plays an important role in Bay Restoration, and she's going to tell us what they're what we're working on there. Thanks, John. Good morning, everyone. I'm Denise Stranko, uh, CBF's federal executive director. D E N I S E S T R A N K O. Um, as John mentioned, the federal government does play a critical role in the implementation of the Chesapeake Clean Water Blueprint. I'm going to highlight just two examples of where we are really hoping to see some additional leadership at the federal level. The first is something that's already been mentioned this morning, and that is funding for ag conservation programs. At the federal level, this really involves both Congress and USDA. Part of what is being considered in the Build Back Better Act is an overall bump up in funding for ag conservation programs in the Farm Bill. These practices and programs support uh, farmers throughout the country, most importantly for us, in the watershed. We support this and are hopeful that as a climate smart initiative, this will be included in the final package passed by Congress and signed by the President. At the same time, USDA must direct more of these dollars to the watershed and particularly to Pennsylvania. We look to USDA to take a leadership role here and establish the Chesapeake Resilient Farms Initiative and target additional financial resources in the co most cost-effective ways possible to the watershed. This will not only help us achieve the reductions necessary for the blueprint, but these ag conservation practices also help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve climate resiliency. The second place we need to see leadership at the federal level is from EPA's Chesapeake Bay Program that coordinates the federal, state, and local partnership to restore the Bay. Under the recently passed Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, the Bay Program will receive an additional $47.6 million above and beyond regular appropriations for the next five years. To put this in perspective, this is a more than 50% increase as compared to what the program has received in recent past years. The Bay program must take advantage of this opportunity and use a significant portion of these funds to accelerate the implementation of on the ground projects that both reduce nutrient and sediment pollution and improve local waters and habitats. And these funds should also be directed to the places where they will be the most impactful. Of course, there's a lot more that can be done at the federal level, but these are two opportunities where Congress and the administration can really step up for the Bay, and we're hopeful that they'll do just that. Thanks. If there are any questions, uh, please use the Q&A function and let me know uh, who you'd like to ask questions of. A uh, question from Steve Davies. Steve? There we go. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thanks, John. Um, yeah, just want to ask John Mueller about the, the litigation. Um, has there been any progress there in terms of uh, talks with the federal government, or is that is the litigation just kind of in abeyance right now? 
against um, me. That is. I'm sorry. I, the the lawsuit uh, against the Commonwealth of the Pennsylvania, or well, I, guess, I guess it's e EPA to enforce. Right. The, sorry. Right. Yep. The, the suit is against EPA, and right. uh, uh, no, there there have, hasn't been any real progress um, in trying to resolve the case short of litigation. So the matter is still pending and the DC District Court. Uh, there are a couple of outstanding motions that we're waiting, waiting for the court to resolve. Um, and that's kind of where we are right now. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, the next question is from Christine Condon. Um, she has two actually, one for Beth and a second for Josh. Christine? Yeah, my first question was for Beth, um, just more about the methodology. I was wondering if she could explain in a little bit more detail how the Chesapeake Bay program scientific model was used and how the current sort of totals were, ca were tabulated. Like, are we just talking about um, when we're talking about the, you know, pollution reductions that have been made so far, are we talking about, um, you know, things that have been fully implemented, things that have been passed by the legislature? Like, how is that tabulated and sort of what's included and what's not, I guess my question is. Yeah, great question. I apologize, it wasn't clear before. So every year, the states report to the Environmental Protection Agency practices that they have gotten on the ground. So it is what they have implemented over time and what they have verified that they've implemented over time. So we take, we use the model or we um, use the available modeling tools to estimate if all those practices were implemented as of 2020, what would the pollution loads to the Bay be? So there's a time delay typically between when you put a practice in the ground and you see a response in terms of actual pollution reductions. So that's why we try to be very clear that these are modeled. If, if, if these practices were implemented and we saw the full benefits of, uh, benefits of them, what would the pollution loads be? We then looked at the trajectory of where we were in 20, 2009, um, where we are now in terms of model pollution reductions and just draw a line and say, if we continued on this trajectory, would we meet our, our planned goals for 2025? And if, if you're off by more than 25%, we graded you red for by sector within 10%, you're um, green and then between 10 and 25%, we graded yellow. So it's a, using the model, basically we, we have graphs that show 2009 we were here, 2020 we're here. If we continued on that straight line, assuming implementation rate is the same, are we on track to meet our pollution reduction goals? Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it's basically coming from state reports and then using modeling to continue that over the next couple of years. That's right, correct. Awesome. Okay, great. And then my other question was just for Josh, you know, he talked about um, stormwater as one of the biggest concerns for Maryland. Uh, I, I guess my question is, can you talk a little bit more logistically about why stormwater is such a big problem for Maryland? And then sort of what are some priorities going into perhaps the General Assembly session this year? And, and also, I know there's some litigation with regard to the MS4s for Baltimore City and County and didn't know if there were any updates there. Yeah, thanks, Christine. A lot, a lot to go in, in that question there. Um, I'll start with uh, stormwater kind of more broadly. So, you know, as, as we talked about, there's been this increase in impervious areas. So rainwater falls on those cities and uh, suburban and urban areas picks up pollutants and runs it off into the bay. And when you look at the, the, the trajectory, we see, especially for nitrogen, that that increases. And that's because nitrogen is soluble in the water and it, 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 it's picked up by this stormwater and our systems really were designed to move that water rapidly away from our urban centers. Um, again, those systems were designed a, a very long time ago. We've seen rapid population growth around those. And so the nitrogen dissolves in the water. It's then pushed off untreated into our waterways rapidly and then moved out into the bay. So that is continuing to increase with the development and then also due to climate change, seeing much uh, more increased, not only overall precipitation, but those bigger, flashier storms. So the things that we do have in place, the existing you know, rain gardens, water basins, um, those aren't able to, to hold and pull that nitrogen out for as long because of how flashy those storms are. So what we're looking for is really that increase in those natural filters, trees, bioretention, um, making sure that the infrastructure that we have is, is as effective as possible. So looking at some of the retrofits of some of the basins, you know, we saw, we've seen uh, counties like Carroll have success in that space, really using those natural filters rather than things that are, are seen as equivalents, right? So things like street sweeping or trading with nutri or, uh, nutrient plants like wastewater treatment plants. 
So those are really the, the things that we're looking for. Um, you know, we talked about funding, right? The, the state of Maryland's budget is in a, is in a strong place. Um, and so we have the, the 5 million trees program that's getting going this year. So see, hoping to see and we'll see more urban tree plantings and more opportunities for funding to throw through, flow through the Chesapeake Bay Trust and some of these other dedicated streams to get those natural filters across the, the waterways. Um, turning attention, and I, I guess I, I want to just take a break and see if, can I answer anything else in there? And then I'll talk a little bit about the lawsuit. Yeah, would you mind just a little bit talking about the inadequacies of street sweeping and other sort of alternative solutions? Yeah, so the, the reason that those are inadequate is because they don't actually stop and hold and retain that water, like I said. They're picking things up. They're, so what the street sweeping is doing is it's, it's removing pollutants from the streets rather than stopping and slowing the water. And we really need that retention and that infiltration for nitrogen. And we also need it for flooding issues and, and for issues of, of you know, human safety. The, those things don't stop and don't control the flow of the water. Uh, so they're, they're kind of seen as equivalents. And, and then again, with the, the trading, you're basically getting the, the pollution reductions from the wastewater plants, but you're not getting those issues, or you're not getting that um, slowing and reduction of that water across the landscape. Gotcha, yeah, you can definitely move on to the litigation piece. I, I wanted to hear about at that and any updates there. Great, yeah. So um, we are, we, we've asked for a we petition for judicial review for the Baltimore City and Baltimore County permits, um, in large part because of the climate change impacts. When we look at those permits and the, um, the one inch standard, what we're seeing is our storms that, that um, are, are far larger than that. And so they're not taking into consideration those larger, I guess, flashier storms. Um, and we need that in order to reduce the, the stormwater pollution coming off the cities and also to protect the citizens. So what we want to see in these permits is, is stronger incorporation of climate change, but also increased requirements for the, the types of practices, you know, ones I just mentioned, uh, bioretention, tree plantings that are going to slow that and hold that and, and infiltrate that water. So when we look across the, the landscape of the permits that were put out, they're just inadequate when it comes to incorporating climate change impacts and 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 pushing the re and requiring the jurisdictions to have the practices we need to tackle those. Awesome, that answers my question. So thank you guys and thank you for holding this. Thanks. The next questions are from Tim Wheeler and I think uh, Allison is going to respond. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, for uh, holding this. Uh, Allison, the question there was uh, mention made that uh, the Bay Region was losing nearly or having nearly twenty five thousand acres of um, urban development. I, can you sort of put some parameters around that? What does that mean exactly? Sure. So what that means then, the Chesapeake Bay model, um, all the land in the watershed is categorized: agriculture, forest, urban, suburban um, development. And what we're seeing is that about twenty five thousand acres a year are going from forest and agriculture into that urban suburban land use. So is it all impervious? I think that was one of your um, questions in the chat. We don't know if it's all impervious, but it is going from a filtering land use to one that is not so filtering. And I think it breaks down to about 10,000 is converted from forest and about 15,000 is agricultural land that is going into urban suburban land use instead. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And there will be a little bit more on that in um, the text of the report as well. Uh, it goes into some details near the final pages. There are some fine points for each of the states. And then um, in the overall, uh, you know, threats ahead about land use, uh, there's more details in there as well. And this is Beth. If Could I add to that? Sure. Just one, just one detail. Tim, you probably heard about um, the fine use um, fine scale land use information that the Chesapeake Bay program spent the last few years acquiring. So the new data that just came out that we referenced in this report was really that finer look at land use. So we have better handle now than we ever have on, on land use changes over time because it's drilling down to like a one meter square um, level now. So a lot more detail, a lot more certainty that what we're seeing is, is actually happening and not just sort of a, a misinterpretation of, of satellite data. Thanks Beth. Mm -hmm. The next question is from Steve Davies. Hey, uh, thanks a lot. I guess this is for Harry and uh, 
and Josh. Uh, a, a Pennsylvania specific question. Have there been any, any discussions with the state conservationist about uh, including silvo pasture as a covered practice in the uh, in the CRP and various working lands programs up there. Yes, and in fact, we we do have a research project actually looking at the effectiveness of silvo pasture as a potential uh, conservation practice that could be widely adapted, at least in applicable situations within the agricultural community. Um, as a, as a practice, uh, as you know, these types of best management practices have to go through an, an explicit approval process throughout, by, through the Chesapeake Bay program in order to be included ultimately as an approved best management practice in the, in the uh, model. And so collecting that information, getting that data, not only will help us understand how effective those things can be, the receptiveness of them uh, by the agricultural community, the success rate of the trees that are being that are being planted and things of that nature. Uh, so it's a process uh, to get that approved, but it's certainly something that's on everyone's radar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And and the other question I had was in the the report that you you just come out with. Uh, do you quantify? Uh, and this I guess would be in in Maryland actually. Do you quantify the value of uh, the implementation of all these cover crops, uh, you know, through the Maryland Cover Crop Program? Have you been able to show just how much nitrogen they prevent from getting into the bay? So I, I think if, if this is a, a kind of a model question, I might pass it over to Beth. But what I can tell you is that we, we do track cover crops really well as a state. Um, the acreage of implementation, um, I believe over 600,000 acres every year. Uh, so we do track that, but I think Beth, if you wanna weigh in on the um, on how we capture that in the model, that'd be great. Sure, um, thanks for the question. So for one thing, there is a lot of good data collected, especially by the University of Maryland on the benefits of cover crops, looking at groundwater infiltration and the reductions there. So we have a pretty good handle on, on the scientific benefits and that's a lot what drove um, program in Maryland, but in model world, it, the results are, uh, the benefits are instantaneous. So we know, for example, that there is a lag time if you're, if nitrogen is, you're preventing nitrogen from going into groundwater, there is a lag time between that, when that groundwater reaches surface water. And so we're assuming the benefits of cover crops are having in, instantaneous benefits, when in reality, um, we're going to see those benefits, um, you know, further in the future, but it is captured both the reduction in surface water runoff, as well as the reductions in groundwater infiltration of nitrogen in particular. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, Beth. I don't see any additional questions. Allison, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? Thanks, John. Um, I just wanted to highlight as you all listened over the last, you know, 40 minutes or so, I hope you take away that we have the science to clean up the bay. We know what needs to be done. You know, each of the states were able to lay out specific actions that can put us on a better trajectory. Denise highlighted at the federal level where we can better partner with, uh, you know, the Department of Agriculture as well as the Environmental Protection Agency. So there is hope that we can still meet 2025. It is not gonna be easy. It is gonna take acceleration. It is gonna, you know, take partnership and hard work, but we know what needs to be done. It's not like some of the other cleanup efforts out there where they're still trying to figure out what the problem is and what the solutions are. We know both, and we are now at a point that we just need to accelerate the implementation on the ground. And that's gonna take dollars, partnership, effort. But I think there is a willingness throughout the watershed and we just need to connect the people to the resources to finish the job. So while it is a, a steady road and a steep road ahead of us, uh, please leave with knowing that we're gonna keep pushing and we have confidence that with the actions outlined today, we can see success, the, the bay can be saved. So thank you for your time this morning. Thanks, Allison. Just a reminder that there is a recording of this Zoom call and it'll be available on our website uh, by about 1.30 today. Uh, if there are any other questions you have, feel free to reach out to me and uh, I'll put you in touch with the appropriate people. Thanks again for your time and uh, 
have a good afternoon. Thanks.